In the previous lesson, we were introduced to basic genetics and we looked at mono and di hybrid crosses. So today we're going to look at different pattern, patterns of inheritance. And in the previous lesson, the example we looked at was complete dominance. So just quickly to recap what complete dominance is, that is when you have a capital allele, a capital T in this case, uh, you have a dominant allele and a recessive allele. So your dominant alleles gives you the dominant trait, in this case a tall plant, and your recessive alleles gives you a recessive trait or a, the more rare trait, which in this case is a small uh, plant, for the example. So usually what this means is if you have a heterozygous individual with a capital T in this case and a small T in this case, um, you will have then still a large or a tall plant because the dominant allele, in this case the capital T, suppresses the effect of the small T. So even though this individual does have the allele to be small, it's not small, it's tall in fact, because the tall allele, the allele that encodes for tallness, suppresses the effect of the small allele. So if this individual were to have children, it's possible that it can pass on the um, small t or the recessive allele onto its children, but this individual, because heterozygous, will then be tall. So there are other types of patterns of inheritance. The second one is called incomplete dominance. So in this case, you have um, a, you get a new phenotype basically. So this example is about color, and we have a red parent and we have a white parent, and for some reason they now produce pink children. In this case, all of their children will be pink. So if we have a homozygous, okay, this one uses um, dominance and recessiveness, but usually when we do this example, both alleles will be equally dominant. So you will have um, a cap, uh, well, R's in this case, and usually W's in that case, but we can actually use this um, example as well, where it's homozygous for one allele, you'll have a red color, homozygous for other allele, you'll have white color, and when you have heterozygous individuals, the heterozygosity then gives us a different color. So the main thing to remember about incomplete dominance is, again, you have the same um, trait you're looking at, a color in this case, but a completely new phenotype comes out. Not one of the parents were pink, all of a sudden now we're pink, based on the fact that two of these alleles, um, both of these different alleles are um, present within these individuals. Then we have co-dominance, and with co-dominance, again, your alleles are equally dominant. In this case, a capital B for black, a capital W for white, and when you have a white individual cross with a black individual, you get offspring that is not gray, but the heterozygous, and they both show the same phenotypes of the parent. They show the white of the one parent and the black of the other parent. So it's kind of like the genes couldn't decide what color this individual should be, so they basically just patched the colors together and showed um, both colors. So again, this differs from incomplete dominance because we don't have a new color. We have the same colors of the parents, black and white, uh, black and white, but both of these colors are present within the offspring. So all your heterozygous individuals then will have a combination of these two colors. Then the, another pattern we get is called multiple alleles. And the basic example for this one is blood types. Because with blood types, we generally have four different blood groups, A, B, A, B, and O. But there are three alleles, now more than two. Usually we're working with two alleles. Three alleles in this case, A allele, B, and O. And the way they pair up gives you the different phenotypes here. So your A allele and B allele are equally dominant. So they would be co-dominant together. That's why you get an AB blood group. So if you have both the A allele and the B allele, you get a completely new phenotype AB blood group. But the O allele is recessive to both B and A. So if you have a combination which is AO, it's going to be a blood group A because A is dominant. When you have a blood group B and O, or these two alleles, you'll have blood type B because um, the B is dominant. So you need two of these O alleles to get actually a blood group O. So in this case, I show you two heterozygous individuals for A and B blood, uh, A and B blood group, and they give you four different phenotype combinations based on or possibilities based on the allele combination. So A O this will have a blood type A child, A B child they can have a B O child, and a blood type O child. 
Okay, so then you also get another pattern called polygenic inheritance. So polygenic means many genes, poly for many, and genic refers to the genes. Polygenic inheritance, and in this case, you have more than one gene. So here they write the genes. Oh, yeah, they actually use it also in a different way. They use capitals and smalls, and they also give a subscript for a certain allele on these chromosomes. So um, usually there are more than one gene and more than one allele as well to give you in this case four different phenotypes black chinchilla himalayan and albino so this rabbit can then have four different color patterns based on what genes they have paired along with which alleles they have paired then also move on to epistasis and this one is actually very fascinating because with epistasis we generally have modifier genes meaning one gene the presence of the one gene modifies the effect of another gene okay so to explain let's use dogs here as an example so here we have one gene a with, which gives you either pigment or no pigment then you have gene b which can give you a black coat color or a brown coat color so in this case, we will have nine individuals that will be black because they have the A allele that gives them pigment, so they will have skin color, and they have a capital B, which makes them black. So, okay, brilliant. Nine of them will be black, the possibility of nine out of 16. And three of them would be brown possibility because, yes, they've got a, uh, the gene for pigment, so they will have skin color, and small Bs, so they will be brown. But four of them, in this case, will be albino because they have this, the recessive allele for pigment, meaning they have no pigment, and they can't have any color. So these three would have been black, but they can't be because they don't have any pigment. This individual right here would have been brown because it has its homozygous recessive, but it won't be brown because it does not have the capital A or it doesn't have pigment. So this refers to um, this is epistasis, the modified genes. So basically, um, your A gene modified the effect of the B gene. So without the A, B can't be shown. Then also we have something called prepotency. So prepotency is when one parent contributes more alleles or um, not really more alleles, but it contributes, it generally um, show uh, gives its alleles to the, the kids, and usually its alleles are dominant. So in this case, let's say this is the dad, and this one is the mother. The mother has short horns, the father has long horns, and all their children has long horns. That would indicate that the father, in this case, has the more prepotent genes. Its genes, in this case, for the horn, is would generally be inherited or passed over to the next generation. So let's say if the female then um, was brown and the father was black and all the kids generally tend to be brown, it means that this female is more prepotent for the brown color. So it depends on the parent that gives more of its traits to the children, that's prepotency. Then lastly, we have atavism. Huh, okay. Atavism is very fascinating. Generally what happens here is if we see I don't want to say a prehistoric characteristic, but a characteristic we have, haven't seen in a species for very long. And all of a sudden now it is visible again. In this case, here we have an example of chicken with teeth. Chickens today do not have teeth, but it actually does happen that now and again, randomly, one is born with one or a couple of, of teeth. Um, this is thought that um, chickens actually evolved from dinosaurs. Dinosaurs had teeth, and as they evolved, they lost that gene that gave them teeth. But since we see it now and again, it shows that that allele for teeth is actually still present somewhere within the family, and along the line, hundreds of years later, we can all of a sudden see it again. So it's a trait that is not seen regularly, but all of a sudden it is seen again. Okay, so here we also have another example of snakes. Snakes do not have legs, but randomly this one does have a leg. So it is thought again that snakes did have legs in prehistoric times or earlier times, but then they evolved and lost their legs. They lost the alleles that would have encoded for them to actually have legs. But now again, somehow that rare allele maybe um, has now surfaced and now some individuals are born with a leg. So it's a trait that was in the species, was lost, and now it's seen again. That's atavism. 
Okay, then we move on to sex determination. So here the best example is to use um, the example of humans, X and Y chromosomes, but some animals we also refer to or having X and Y chromosomes. Sometimes we use the letters Z or W and so on to refer to sex, but it just depends on the species and the scientists um, working with it. In this case, let's look at X and Y. Most people are aware of it. So if you have an XX individual, it's female. If you have an XY individual, it's male. I just want to point out here, uh, we don't call them X and Y chromosomes because of their shapes. It just happens to be X refers to the female um, chromosome and Y to the male chromosome. But the Y chromosome literally physically is smaller than your X chromosome. So the Y chromosome has actually less genes and DNA than your X chromosome. So um, this will be important for the next slide. Okay, so in this case, usually why this is important, this simple planet is just showing us that when you have um, the male gametes and the female gametes and they can fuse, there will always be a 50% chance to get a female and a 50% chance of getting a male, how these um, gametes form. So in real, well in life, for humans or it doesn't matter which um, organism it is, there will always be a 50% chance with every mating to get a male and with every mating a 50% chance of getting a female. Okay, so now it's going to be important to understand how the Y chromosome works for sex linked traits. So in this case, um, only the X chromosome, since it has more genes and alleles, it happens to carry the gene for the color black. And the B allele here shows you for black color. And the R allele gives you a red individual. And again, it's just on the X chromosome. So here we have a black male, a red female, and they are crossed. And here is the possibilities of what children they can have. So this shows us when you have an R allele and a B allele coming together, you will get something called calico, calico color. So again, these two alleles are co-dominant because the R doesn't suppress the effect of the B and the B does not um, um, suppress the effect of the R. So now we get a new phenotype, a calico color. But what they're trying to show here is that males can never be calico. In this case, here we have an R allele. So this individual, the male, will be red, and this one will also be red. In other instances, if, let's say, this X had a B on it, the male would be black, like the parent here. But you will never get a calico one. Why? Because the Y chromosome doesn't have the allele at all for color. So there can't be that co-dominant effect, ever. So only females can be calico. Males, in this case, in, the, in this crossing, all of them will be red or orange in color. Um, but males in general can either be red or black. Only females can be red, black or calico. Okay, and that's it for this first lesson, second lesson.